We are in the special collections at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. We're on the second floor of Lupton Library. The John T. Wilder papers that we have here at the university, uh, a collection that we acquired around 1960 from one of Do uh, General Wilder's daughters who was still alive at the time. and She donated these a collection of military documents and letters that uh, her father wrote to their mother in Indiana during the war. Wilder, after the war, did what a lot of Union officers did. He moved to Chattanooga from Indiana or from the Midwest, and he became a prominent businessman in town and an industrialist um, throughout the South. He opened a series of mines throughout Tennessee into North Carolina. He was an entrepreneur. He opened up several hotels. He was always working uh, new ventures and money-making um, opportunities and would get them rolling and stay with them for two or three years and then he would sell um, and start something else. He was also the mayor of Chattanooga uh, in 1870 and the postmaster of the city as well. So he was sort of a prominent citizen of the late 1800s for Chattanooga. So I think it's appropriate that, that uh, we get this collection of letters that uh, he had during the war that he wrote to his, to his wife. One thing I find very interesting is a lot of the letters start off like letters that we used to write always started off by asking the person, why haven't you written more? He'll start off with letters to his wife, I haven't received a letter from you. He's sort of complaining about that. But I think back during the Civil War, they weren't as particular about people writing troop movement details in their letters. I know during World War II especially, soldiers' letters had to be censored by their superiors. These give a lot of information about what they're doing and what they are planning to do. And Wilder gives a lot of information about the foraging missions that his troops went on, the skirmishes, the battles. I, I find one very interesting that he wrote. His division missed out on the Battle of Shiloh by a day. They got there a day late. But he writes home on April 16, 1862, from the battlefield and he's writing to his wife what he sees as he rides onto the battlefield of Shiloh just the day after the battle and he says, I will not attempt to tell you of the awful destruction on the battleground which covered a space of about 25 square miles. The dead lay on every acre of it when we came here. There was just about two rebels for each one of ours, probably about 3,000 in all dead. Hundreds of trees shivered to splinters, gun carriages torn to bits, dead horses by the droves, heads, arms, legs, and mangled bodies strewn around, all combined to make up a picture of horrors that it would be well for our infernal pol political leaders to look on, and if they did not, then learn to mind their own business to be made a part of it. He was one of the first officers on either side of the war to equip his soldiers with a Spencer repeating rifle. And that gave his troops a real big advantage over the single shot uh, um, rifles that most of the soldiers used. The Spencers could uh, fire seven shots without reloading versus the shoot and reload, shoot and reload. So he, he really gained an upper hand on Confederate troops during the war. Because of uh, them getting the Spencer repeating rifles, uh, they were just a, a lethal division to, be, to, to encounter. And it was because of that, they became known as the, as the Lightning Brigade. Prior to that, they'd actually been known as the Hatchet Brigade because all his men carried hatchets, not for warfare, but just, just for uh, camp necessities. He also was very instrumental in the Battle of Chickamauga, which was just across the border into Georgia here, one of the last troops to, to leave, Union troops to leave the battlefield. And he helped protect General George Thomas, who later became the known as the Rock of Chickamauga. Uh, he protected his troops um, later in uh, at the last part of the war. After the Battle of Chickamauga in the, the late summer of 1863, he was pretty much done with the war. He went home. He was, he was pretty sick. And he went home for the remainder of the year. When he rejoined his outfit in early 1864, um, it was a, a very reduced capacity. And I believe by halfway through the war, through 1864, he was pretty much done. And then he did receive a promotion to the rank of, of Brigadier General at that time. But most of what he accomplished during the war, he did as a colonel. This letter he writes from Camp Wycliffe in Kentucky in January 18, 1862. And he writes, my dear wife, I have not written you for some time as I have been quite sick with pneumonia. 
was taken New Year's Day. Am not yet quite able for duty. Expect to be able by Monday to resume work. We are lying still here and no prospect for an advance on the enemy. Our men are about half fit for duty. Balance sick. This is the unhealthiest camp I have ever seen. Western Virginia, no comparison to it. Well, you see a, a, a soldier and an officer riding home during the war. And it was a war that he, he enlisted in. He was not drafted. But it just gives a good historical account of, of the, the things that they faced, the obstacles and the triumphs that they had. But it was a hard life. And I think a lot of people don't realize that, that, that a lot of the, the casualties in the Civil War were not battle wounds. It was illness and sickness. And Wilder certainly experienced that. And he writes periodically throughout the war that I, I'm not feeling well. They have, at one point, they had to carry him by ambulance. And it's, it's obvious from some of these that when he was in the middle of some of the hardest fighting, he was sick. And he was able to still lead his men. And as soon as that battle was over, apparently he would collapse and they would, they would take him to the hospital where he would recover or, or go home to recover. One thing that I, I think is very um, significant in, in his career, in the fall of 1862, he was sent, when he was home in Indiana gathering recruits, he was taking them back to the, the battlefield and was diverted to a little town in western Kentucky because the Confederate General Braxton Bragg's full army was heading north and he was to go there and wait for the full Union group, and there was, there was going to be a, a, a pretty big battle. But he went up there with just a couple of hundred troops and got completely surrounded by the Confederate army of about 50,000. He held them off for several days, waiting for the Union troop that never came, the Union army that never came, and eventually negotiated a surrender by, and I don't know if this had ever been done in warfare before, he went in under a flag of truce to the Confederate camp and, and sought out a Confederate officer he understood was a gentleman and asked for his advice. And I'm sure he pled something to the effect of, I'm not a militarily trained. What, what would an officer, should an officer do in this situation where I'm pretty much told not to surrender, but you say you're, you've surrounded me with 50,000 men to my you know, couple, maybe 500. Um, can I see proof that your army is as big as, as, as it is? And this officer said, sir, this is not how wars are fought. But later in his memoirs, he wrote, but I took an instant liking to this man and wouldn't have you know, led him astray for anything. So they gave him a tour of, of, of the Confederate armies and, and saw that you know, he was outnumbered. And at that point, Wilder, then negotiated a surrender where I'm sure he negotiated where his men were not imprisoned but, but sent home. And like I said earlier, he, um, he was paroled, he was sent home, and uh, about two or three months later, the um, Union Army worked out an exchange where he could come back in. Um, and I, I'm sure the Confederates got somebody exchanged for him. But I thought it was just a very unique approach to a very desperate situation when he was Left, left hanging out to dry and was able to hold off an army that outnumbered his probably 100 to 1, if not 1,000 to 1, um, for several days.